Okay, a warm welcome to everyone to this year's Anton Willem Amo lecture of the Martin Luther University, Halle Wittenberg. My name is Olaf Zenka and I'm professor of social and cultural anthropology at the university's department for anthropology and philosophy. It's also a great pleasure and honor to welcome our distinguished speaker tonight, Professor Olufemi Taiwo. Before introducing him in more detail, I would like to say a few words about Anton Wilhelm Amo, as well as the Amo lectures here at Martin Luther University. Anton Wilhelm Amo is considered the first and for a very long time the only Afro-German academic. Amo was born around 1700 in what is now Ghana and was enslaved as a young child. Via Amsterdam, he ended up as a so-called human gift of the Dutch West India Company at the court of the Duke of Braunschweig Wolfenbüttel, where he was baptized Anton Wilhelm, named after the Duke and his son. While working as a court servant, Amo also received a formal education. In 1727, he took up his studies at the University of Halle at the faculties of philosophy and of law, where he completed a first Latin disputation in 1729 on the rights of black people in Europe with implications for Roman law practice in Germany at the time. Subsequently, he studied and taught at the Faculty of Philosophy in Wittenberg, where he was awarded a doctorate in philosophy in 1734. His Latin dissertation is dedicated to the mind-body problem. Afterwards, Amo was admitted to the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Halle as a lecturer. Three years later, in 1739, he also taught at the University of Jena. Little is known about the years that followed. Racist comments cast a shadow over Amo's situation around 1747. At that time, he is said to have left Germany for West Africa. He lived at least until 1753 in Aksim, later in Sharma, in southwest Ghana, where his gravestone can also be found today, which displays his years of death as 1784. In the 1960s, under the impression of the friendship of nations among the then German Democratic Republic and newly independent African post-colonial states, Amos' life and work were rediscovered and became the object of intensified research here at the University of Halle, most notably by the work of Professor Burkhard Benches. In 1975, a bronze plaque in memory of Amo was placed next to the main campus of the University of Halle. Since 1994, the Martin Luther University has annually awarded the Anton Wilhelm Amo Prize for Outstanding Theses. And in recent years, especially over the past 10 years, numerous activities such as workshops, conferences, and series of talks <coughs> have emerged within our university, engaging the work and legacy of Amo. It is within this wider context that the Anton Wilhelm Amo lectures have been organized since 2013 by the two research clusters, Society and Culture in Motion and Enlightenment Religion Knowledge at Martin Luther University. The Amo lectures feature internationally acclaimed scholars presenting their ongoing research on themes connected to or emanating from the work of Amo. Dedicating a lecture at our university to Anton Wilhelm Amo seems highly appropriate, given that this was, after all, his alma mater. What better way than to use a public lecture to, to take seriously Amo as a scholar and to remember his legacy that has been neglected and excluded? At the same time, Given that the academic format of a lecture is so deeply embedded in and emblematic of the Western epistemic formation itself, the question arises, can a lecture evoke and bring into existence the potentialities of an otherwise that goes beyond the limitations of that epistemic formation that we want to critically interrogate and decenter? The AMO lectures want to keep open for reflection and discussion the uncanny simultaneity of an absent present potential for lecturing on such an otherwise, on, with, through, and beyond the work of Amo. For this reason, the Amo lectures draw inspiration from Derrida's concept of under erasure, crossing out a word while keeping it legible in order to signal its inadequate yet necessary nature. 
Therefore, the Amo lectures use the format of a lecture named in honor of Amo while putting the term lecture under erasure in order to highlight its ambiguous existence as both the means for critical reflection and metonymically standing in for the Western formation itself, the potential object of such critique. This brings me directly to our distinguished speaker today. Olufemi Tayo is Professor of African Political Thought and current chair at the Africana Studies and Research Center at Cornell University in the United States. He's a leading scholar of social and political philosophy, African philosophy, and the philosophy of law, engaging with multiple topics in the fields of African political thought, global African intellectual history, modernity and colonialism, as well as liberalism and empire. Prominently, Femi has engaged in various attempts to reinscribe into the narratives of the philosophical discourse of modernity the work of those African thinkers who have embraced modernity and have attempted to remake African life and thought within its modality. His numerous publications include Legal Naturalism, a Marxist Theory of Law, published with Cornell University Press in 1996, How Colonialism Preempted Modernity in Africa, published by Indiana University Press in 2010, which won the Franz Fanon Book Award in 2015, a polemic titled Africa Must Be Modern, a manifesto that came out also with Indiana University Press in 2014. The 2021 pamphlet, Can a Liberal Be a Chief? Can a Chief Be a Liberal? on an unfinished business of colonialism, published with Prickly Paradigm Press, and just last year with Hearst, Against Decolonization, Taking African Agency Seriously. Olofemi Tayo is a longtime defendant of analytically and politically distinguishing between and separating the project of modernity on the one hand from the project of colonialism on the other. In recent work, he has started reinscribing into the history of modern philosophy the contributions of those that he describes as excluded moderns. Today, he will continue this important project. Before I hand over the word to Femi, just last, uh, three last pieces of information. First, if you're following the lecture online, please use the chat function for your comments and questions. And Thomas, who's following the chat, will then read out some of the questions later on for the Q&A. Secondly, we would like to inform you that we are um, recording only the lecture part, but not the Q&A, so that we can display it later on on our AMO website. And so you can come back and listen again to, AMO, uh, to Olufemi's talk. And last but not least, we recently started not only a new website for the AMO lectures, but also a new publication series with the University of Halle Press, both in print and as an open access publication, which is accessible via the AMO website. Here is the last year's lecture given by Sabelo and Lovo Gacceni, which you can get access, open access through the website, but also order, of course, in print. And today's lecture by Olufemi will also, of course, be published in due course. So check the website for this forthcoming publication. Femi, thank you very much for inviting, for, for accepting our invitation. And the floor is all yours. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much. How else will I know you are here and not just pretending to be here? Um, <clears throat> I would like to begin by thanking Professor Dr. Olaf Zenger, who extended to me the original invitation to be a part of this important series. My profuse thanks go too to Thomas Gutzelman here and Henrietta. <clears throat> Thomas has been the point person in ensuring that I show up today. And I'm sure if you ask him, he will honestly tell you what a chore that can be. <clears throat> I thank the Department of Anthropology for housing and seriously supporting this series. I look forward to engaging graduate students in the department tomorrow 
and I'm thanking them in advance for reading my book and subscribing to a conversation around it. To all of you, my audience, I'm always deeply appreciative of the time that you all in your different locations online and even much more so in person devote to sharing with me the gift of conversation. I hope that what follows partly compensates you for your investment. I make no promise. In recent work, <clears throat> I have been concerned to re-inscribe into the history of modern philosophy the contributions of those that I have called, quote unquote, excluded moderns, who originated from and sometimes did their work in the African corner of the intellectual globe. I cannot think of a better place to begin this lecture than with the person, Anton Wilhelm Amo, in whose name it is chartered, elements of whose life and legacy and the difficulties attached to both continue to be evident, sadly, in our own time and remain pointers to how not to do philosophy in Africa or constitute the archives of Euro-American philosophy going forward. This also ties in with the rubric for the series that Professor Senka has shared for the series, channeling the conflicted relationship between Amos' work and the narratives of the ferment within which his work derived meaning, if not identity. I shall say more about this presently. <clears throat> no, I have not read the Sapatheia of the Mind. That was the dissertation that he did here. But I have kept abreast uh, that he did, you know, at the other university. But I have kept abreast of discussions about him since I was introduced to him and his work in my graduate student days at the then University of Ife, now called Obafemi Awolowo University in Ilefe, Nigeria, in the early 80s of the last century. It is with the late Kwasi Wiredo's commentary on the apatheia that I shall be concerned here. In an article titled, Amos Critique of Descartes' Philosophy of Mind, Wiredu did two things. First, he assessed as a matter of debate, the strength of the case made by Amo against Cartesian philosophy of mind. I am sure that in the vast literature of Descartes' interlocutors going back to the 18th century, when Amo conducted his research and recorded his results, from a lofty professorial chair in what was, and I hope still remains, an accredited institution, you are unlikely to find a single joining of issues with AMO as an interlocutor in that discourse. Uh, what I'm saying is you are not likely to discover when you look at that discourse that AMO was ever there or was part of that conversation. And I have referenced this sort of absence in our own time with the cold reception that the absolutely superlative work of the late Ghanaian Platonist. I don't know what is wrong with Ghanaians that they produce these great minds, especially in philosophy, but that is a discussion for another day. They just do it. We read with Ghanaian. The man I'm about to mention was Ghanaian. Amo was Ghanaian. What is wrong with them? I mean, and the other countries in Africa? Ghanaians, please listen. <clears throat> Professor J.T. Bituado, another of my worthy teachers, has been given. Um, he was a scholar of Plato's Theodoros and wrote some of the most important papers in the field, attested by many of my colleagues who are always embarrassed when I shove their work, his work in their faces. And they say, oh, where's this man? I say, it's in one of your journals, so why are you not talking about him? But that's a different story. <clears throat> But I draw the implications of this neglect for my discussion today in a moment. Second, and this is what interests me, Wiredu speculated on what might have been the origin of Amo's understanding of the nature of mind. Additionally, he considered the issue of where Amo's work belongs in the annals of philosophy, African, European, or what else. This is where my difficulty stems from and provides the entry point for my lecture. My lecture, by the way, is titled Rewriting the History of Modern Philosophy, colon, on philosophy of history, political philosophy, and liberal education in 19th century West Africa. 
Would those answers to both questions bother me? First, he speculated that what Amo eventually settled upon as the nature of the mind, the point on which he diverged from Descartes and its relation to the body, may plausibly be traced to what may have survived in his consciousness from his brief, and it was very brief, life as an Akan child before he was transferred to Europe as a slave. He was about three years old when that happened, uh, and he exited, you know. Absent a dubious preoccupation with identity, why would we be interested in looking for trace survivors of a culture in the consciousness of an individual who never in his conscious life lived in that culture? How could we even persuade ourselves that such an explanation might be remotely plausible? When it comes to the issue of pedigree, that is, whether or not his work is an exemplar of African philosophy, the situation is no less problematic. In what universe of discourse did his work have meaning? Who were his interlocutors? What ferment did his work empty into? To none of those questions will it be remotely plausible to answer Africa or African or any of their cognates. These are no idle questions. Yes, he did return to Ghana in his twilight years, but we have no evidence that he became a part of an intellectual ferment of the sort that had been his home all his life in Europe, and there are no surviving records of his reflections on his immediate context in Ghana. In accepting to contort ourselves into funny shapes, in the mistaken belief that we are rehabilitating a thinker, and giving him his due in history or philosophy, we end up, even if unwittingly, letting off the hook his successors in the culture to which he belonged, who for all sorts of ignoble reasons decided to offer him and his work. Let us be very clear. In denying him membership of that culture, his deniers had no other justification than his epidermal inheritance and their illogical belief that that made him not a Saxon, German, or European thinker. When we go along with that judgment, we too become complicit in the racializing of thought when we should be historicizing thought, about which I'm going to say more. This is why this goes to the very heart of my work. It has been my object since I stumbled on the issue while working on a different book, but which work issued in my How Colonialism Preempted Modernity in Africa, to take seriously and stop beggaring when we are not shaming those Africans, both in the continent and the diaspora it has spawned across the globe, who have found cause to embrace modernity and its poor tenets, and make themselves worthy interlocutors in its many discourses from philosophy to religion, from music to literature, from the fine and performing arts to language. We shall see presently how, once we allow free reign to the African imagination and stop constricting it with unhelpful, sometimes gaudy politics of identity, the path is open to engaging the widest swathes of African intellectual contributions, regardless of our agreement or non-agreement with them. It is in that spirit that I call on us to engage the thinkers highlighted here today. Even though I think geography may be neutral enough when it comes to placing thinkers and their ideas, I am persuaded that temporalities are the least problematic for these purposes. When Amo was writing, what he was writing, the farmer within which he wrote, those who were his interlocutors, the dominant ideas they traded amongst themselves, their relations to ideas that came before them, would be located in that temporality that we generally call modern, or more specifically, early modern European philosophy. It was not only those who looked a certain way or operated in only one register, Caucasian, who were paragons of that culture and who took part in the discourse that arose around Carthesian themes. It stands to reason that any narrative of that discourse or period that omits the contributions of those like Amo, who are European, but not Caucasian or white, as we now characterize that identity, must remain incomplete, possibly false. This has been the object of recent work that I've been doing 
on the history of philosophy, specifically the history of the philosophical discourse of modernity. I have adopted a two-pronged approach to this undertaking. First, I challenge the narrative of Euro-American philosophy by I hardly ever call it Western philosophy. Because if it's Western philosophy, you must realize that the road from Athens to Königsberg passed through Damascus. So what that means is that you must take very seriously the very important role that Islamic philosophy played in the European rediscovery of the Greeks back in the medieval period. So I usually just call it Euro-American to specify geographically you know, where this is concerned because Western is much more than geography. So that's my <clears throat> explanation. <clears throat> First, I challenge the narrative of Euro-American philosophy by identifying those that my friends who invited my reflections to an anthology on philosophy and race tagged problem moderns and counterposing to them those that I called excluded moderns. The former problem moderns are the founders of what is referred to as the canon, such as David Hume and Immanuel Kant, who performed the original exclusion by their racializing thought, sometimes issuing in obvious non sequiturs that we persist in dressing up as worthy of engagement. I don't. When you say, oh, I looked at him from head to toe, and he was black from head to toe, and from that I can tell he couldn't think. Will you find a better one non sequitur than that? What does how a man look have to do with, and as I wrote in the paper, the fact that a non sequitur emanates from Kant does not mean we should take it any more seriously, if we take our logic you know, very seriously. <clears throat> so that's why you're not likely to find me writing a rejoinder to Hume's footnote. It won't happen. <clears throat> the latter are those excluded moderns, are those excluded from the narrative even though they were full participants and worthy interlocutors in the discourse. Their only reason for exclusion being their epidermal inheritance such as Amo, Phyllis Whitley, David Walker, Otoba Kuguano, and Olauda Equiano, to mention only a few. Equiano always loved to trot out because he lived and Kugano at the same time as Thomas Jefferson. And both Equiano and Jefferson wrote on freedom. But here's the history. Equiano's work went through eight editions by subscription. I don't think that ever happened to anything Jefferson wrote. So how do we write the history of the Enlightenment and put Jefferson and not put Equiano? Yes, we may think that Equiano was an inferior thinker, but let's show cause why that is true and argue with that and make a case for it. That's my point. <clears throat> the second prong is furnished by my focus on African scholars who are complicit in our exclusion by a blithe acceptance of the racialization of thought, which we enact by, con by a conflation of modernity with westernization and both with colonialism. I argue in this lecture that the discourse of modernity that is almost identical with the modern period in the history of philosophy is one to which thinkers of African descent from those that I just mentioned uh, in the 18th century to Alexander Cromwell, James Africanus Bill Horton, and Edward Wilmer Blyden in the 19th century contributed, and for that reason ought to feature in its annals. To the extent that they are not accommodated in the narratives of the discourse, we have reason to believe that those narratives are incomplete, inadequate, and possibly incorrect. This is one part of my second prong. The other part has to do with African scholars' attachment to what I call, in my book, Against Decolonization, Taking African Agencies Seriously, quote, a bastard periodization, end quote that makes us rest content in having only th three periods in African history, either of events, institutions, practices, or ideas. On this understanding, the works of Amo Equiano, Philip Kweku, uh, Philip Kweku was actually uh, another Ghanaian from the 18th century, uh, who was the first 
African to be ordained a minister in the Church of England. And he worked, you know, as uh, a minister to many slavers, you know, uh, on the coast uh, in Ghana, you know, while he lived, schooled their children, created schools for them, you know, and all that. And um, um, I hope somebody takes a look at his letters, which were put out, another version of his letters were put out by my friend five years ago from the University of South Africa Press. <clears throat> There's a lot there of philosophy to be found. <clears throat> All excluded moderns automatically become orphaned in the African narrative too, because they don't fit into the quote unquote pre-colonial category. Devoted not to a real temporality, but an identity inflected, difference-based search for African phenomena characterized by what Bjorn Jaffer has called absolute autochthony. We must separate ourselves from this and open the spaces of African intellectual engagement in the widest manner imaginable. Once we abjure the metaphysics of difference, historicize modernity, and shamelessly appropriate the benefits of the Gregorian calendar, as do the rest of the world as a routine matter, our philosophical landscape immediately begins to team with interlocutors ranging from ancient Egypt and Nubia, Asia Minor, the Mediterranean continuum, and simultaneously, Africa starts being a loud absence from all those chronologies comparing happenings, ideas, and historical actors in synchrony across the globe. We immediately make it possible to see how events in Mansa Musa's Mali in the 14th century compare with those in the Aztec Empire and in the Nordic countries, not to talk of India or the Korean Peninsula. So we think Africa together with the rest of the world, as Africa is. This is what I mean by rewriting the history of modern philosophy, by taking seriously the disquisitions of modern thinkers working in West Africa in that period. I can do this because I have no truck with identity. And I don't think that looking for pure African stuff holds any promise of illumination to our understanding. As we see in the history of civilizations, the addiction to purity is always the path to death. Only the hybrid survived. Think of the present fortunes of the English and French languages respectively. I rest my case. Uh, the next section is, you know, material from Leopold Cesar Senghor that actually gives a very neat capsule of the history of philosophy that covers everywhere, Asia, Africa, Europe, in one breath. This was a speech that he gave at the University of Cairo, you know, uh, back in 1977, but I'm not going to uh, take time for that. There, in a capsule, is the history of what we facilely but problematically call Western philosophy. The author, fully cognizant of the many and diverse hands that had tilled its soil. Notice how Senghor wove into his description Asia, Africa, and Europe, and his account is based on historical foundations. On a more serious note in this lecture, contrary to the bastard periodization that dominates the historiography of African ideas, I present evidence of philosophy of a standardly modern variety, which is by no means the only one we should care about, being done in West Africa in the 19th century that could not answer to the problematic categories of traditional or pre-colonial African philosophy. I introduced three thinkers who lived and worked in West Africa during the period, whose ideas belong in the annals of modern philosophy. I look at the works of James Africanus Bill Horton, Alexander Cromwell, and Edward Wilmot Blyden, focusing specifically on their philosophy of history in the case of Cromwell, political philosophy in the case of Horton, and philosophy of education in the case of Blyden. <clears throat> it is time the narratives of the history took seriously the essential hybridity that defines the field. The continuing failure to do so makes it impossible for honest teachers of philosophy to deliver its history and register truthfully the biographies of its contributors located in West Africa. 
I have identified elsewhere three connets, three core tenets of modernity. I'm not going to expound them. The principle of subjectivity, the centrality of reason, and the idea of progress. In their diverse ways, our three thinkers embrace these tenets and the many implications they yield for their views of human nature and its place in the world. Reason was what set humans apart from other creatures, and even as all three agreed that this was a divine gift, none of them thought that our understanding of the world or how we explain phenomena, human or otherwise, should be guided, much less determined by authority, tradition, or revelation. And Cromwell was a minister of the Episcopalian Church. <clears throat> Both individuals and societies were to be judged by this criteria and their respective places on the scale of civilization thus determined. It is no accident that Cromer was the founder of the American Negro Academy in 1897. This point bears emphasis because thanks to the conflation we earlier referred to, it is almost sacrilegious, if I may be permitted a religious reference, for an African descended person to acknowledge that there ever was a time that their societies were backward, uncivilized even. The situation is not held by the racist traducers of African humanity who claim ownership of civilization for themselves and only reserve primitivity and subhuman status for Africans. What complicates the situation is that all three thinkers under review here considered that the Africa of their time was backward. And this they did using language that was indistinguishable from that of their fellow moderns, problem moderns, that is, like Hume, Kant, and Hegel. This is a very hard pill to swallow for those, for instance, who lionized Blyden, the originator of the phrase, the African personality, the stout defender of African values, who, at a later point in his career, asked black peoples to forswear Christianity and embrace Islam instead. This explains the studied neglect of these aspects of his writings. The same is true of the near total silence on the part of African scholars regarding the works of James Africanus Houghton. That is about to change in a big way with a dissertation on him and another contemporary thinker from Egypt, uh, whose name I will not mention, that's for my student that I'm about to mention, uh, by my student Zayad El Nabolsi. Uh, he's defending this dissertation next month, and I expect it to go from defense to a book. Is that good? <clears throat> when it comes to Cromwell, he is forever interpreted from the point of view of Africana studies, but never as part of the discourse of African philosophy, a notable exception being Kwame Anthony Appiah. Yet, here was a thinker who lived in Monrovia and taught at the college there while he was an ordained minister of the Episcopalian Church. One other thing to add, all these three thinkers knew one another, interacted with one another. Two of them taught at the same college in Liberia. Horton was a surgeon who lived in Sierra Leone but worked across all British colonies in the then, you know, British colonies in West Africa. So this is another point for a dissertation for anybody looking, you know, for the history of ideas, you know, for the relationship of these three and what they were doing during that period and what were the dynamics of their relationships. <clears throat> Identity is a terrible thing to be wedded to. It was what led to the racialization of thought in the first place that led to the exclusion of Africans from a discourse to which many of them were top-notch contributors. The error is compounded when they are further denied by those looking for some special identity marked by absolute, absolute difference on the African side of the divide. I have no truck with either. If an idea is modern in ways to be specified and agreed upon, the demographic, including linguistic pedigree of its promoter, is absolutely irrelevant. This means that when all three thinkers granted that theirs was a benighted inheritance, they were not considering anything to racists. Let's think of them rather as resident contrarians of their societies who were convinced that their societies needed some remediations. What is more, 
their historical approach as opposed to dubious genetic or biological ones favored by racists allowed them to compare their societies to others, including those in Europe, to show that the patterns exhibited by theirs can be explained by clear historical circumstances and unquestionably remediable. It also meant that they free themselves from the constraint of thinking that acknowledging lack and seeking to remedy the same from comparative human experience elsewhere is wrong or to be shunned. <clears throat> Let's begin with Horton. Unlike now when serious scholars talk nebulously about pre-colonial African political philosophy, Horton lived in a colony but did not date his historiography by it. Indeed, even as Freetown was a colony, think the irony, Freetown, colony. Hmm. It was only one, it was on only in an administrative sense. The most important framework for living and thinking for his dominant demographic was Christianity. And because he lived with the direct experience of the heterogeneity that marked the political systems across West Africa during this time, he could not have spoken of such unhelpful agglomerations as, quote unquote, the African political tradition or the African legal or African ethical tradition. It was a time when full colonialism had not been imposed and the British were differing as to what to do with their growing acquisitions along the coast. Many African polities that would later come under colonial rule were still independent and self-governing. It was also a period teeming with many and varied constitutional experiments in his neighborhood, especially under Islamic inspiration uh, during that period. And here's a long quote from Horton. In viewing the map of West Africa and tracing out those political communities, which are not due to the agency of more civilized politicians, we affirm that there are amongst them fixed and established governments, although rude and barbarous, that the obedience to the supreme power in many cases is implicit. The right of property is enforced by adjudicator. And although the power of the supreme head has been used with extreme despotism, as in Dahomey and Ashanti, both polities that Hegel referenced, you know, both in the philosophy of right and the philosophy of history, by the way. <clears throat> Yet still, it is as truly a political government as that of France or England. Examining West Africa in its entirety, we find it to be composed of a number of political communities. And he was not saying this as an armchair thinker. He traveled to all those places to study those political arrangements before he commented on them. <clears throat> so this was not speculative on his part. We find it to be composed of a number of political communities, each ruled by a national government, formed in many cases of distinct nationalities occupying determined territory. But some national communities are broken up into fractional, innumerable fractional sections governed by rebel chiefs or satraps. Others depend upon a political body whose sovereign chief rules over life and property, and others again are under well-regulated civilized government. But in order to develop these different nationalities, a true political science it is necessary that the inhabitants should be made acquainted with the useful arts and the physical conditions which influence other more civilized and refined political governments. What, it may be asked, are the different forms of government now in existence on the west coast of Africa? The two principal forms are the monarchical and the republican. Now, I always ask people, you read this, and then you read a lot of what we are writing now on so-called African political thought, especially in, you know, things like African traditional political thought. And you don't see these distinctions that Horton was making because those who are writing them don't read Horton. And what they are offering is based on identity because they have to show that Africa had government, something that Horton had written in the 19th century and had done so in a very sophisticated way. And we can argue with him, you know, in terms of his own preference. <clears throat> As a consequence of the presence of this treasure trove of constitutional types, 
Horton did not have to dredge up any romantic notions of modes of governance in West Africa, at least. Meanwhile, scientist that he was, and seized as he was of the idea of seeing his continent march from backward to civilization, that was the linguistic currency back then, from Africa to Asia to even parts of Europe. Um, if people are interested, just look at, you know, Ibrahim Abu Lugard's Arab rediscovery of Europe, you know, and then the guy who took modernity to Japan, you know, all of them, the language they used to use was the importance of bringing civilization and civilization for them all across board was Western civilization back then. <clears throat> He conducted a survey of modes of governance across the region, came up with a taxonomy of sorts and a ranking based on his own preference. And here goes Hutton again. Proper legislative science is entirely unknown to them. They possess no means by which a continuous and profitable revenue can be brought into their imperial coffers. No proper determination of political causes and consequently no established principle which might be made to form a guide to the legislature in the making of new laws or the alteration of old ones. And thus for ages, they have shown no improvement in the executive administration and possess no legal status and no generalized principle of international law. So his preference, what he calls civilized political science was modern political science. And he's saying, yes, we do have all these old forms, but we need to move them to a different place. We may not him for his preference, and I think that's what we should do as philosophers. But it is suspect, if not downright sloppy scholarship, that prefers instead to talk of, quote-unquote, traditional, traditional African political thought or philosophy, or its many just as unilluminating equivalents. Again, unlike the colonialism-inspired anthropology that manufactured a flattened African reality marked by absolute alterity that many of us now use to talk about African phenomena, Hutton knew, as we seem neither to know nor care now, that African societies and their intellectual and material cultures were not all equal or characterized by the same level of development at any given time. Because his preference was for the modern liberal representative democracy, better realized in a republic, even though later in a section, he said, for that moment, you know, what people needed was a constitutional monarchy but the king must be elected, not hereditary, no status for him, you know, right there. He graded the modes of governance he found as better, the more they were founded on the consent of the governed, and less desirable, the more distant they were from that criterion. It is not for nothing that a severest critic in our own time, Emmanuel Ayodele, has designated him, quote, the father of political science in Africa. End of quote. Uh, let me save us time and move to the next. You know. <clears throat> Let's now consider Blyden's justification for an embrace of liberal education. Unfortunately, the latter part of his life, where he became a trenchant critic of racism, a position he always shared, has edged out the other portions of the life of a mind and a life defined by erudition, cosmopolitanism, a Neapolimath, master of 12 languages, and one of the most important thinkers of the 19th century period. All these dimensions of a richly textured life has been panel beaten into the dull life of an opposition thinker, driven by his black identity, conditioned by, quote unquote, the African personality, his coinage, and rendered illegible to the world of ideas as a worthy influence to be cultivated by one and all in the domain of the mind. What a shame. This is the place to remind us of something that is there in the literature, but is likely to elude us once we proceed from a racializing standpoint. Our three exemplars were all participants in a race discourse in the 19th century that took race for granted and did social philosophical, historical analysis framed by the idea of race. Whether they deployed it for good or ill, they all accepted the reality of races. Those, like our exemplars, who pushed back against racism 
agreed that they were progeny of a race that, like other races, had its own gift to share with common humanity, and slavery and creeping colonialism had held Africans back from fully developing this gift and sharing it with the world. It was in part this idea that, I am almost convinced, W.B. Du Bois clumsily appropriated in his essay, The Conservation of Races, and which he spent considerable energy thereafter trying to clarify as the world began to cast doubt on the idea of race and its utility for making sense of phenomena. That is why in their works, they always spoke in comparative terms, and they never fell into the trap of talking as if African humanity represented a different species. That was the thesis of the racists. <clears throat> we can now see why they had no difficulty, as we seem these days to do, with acknowledging the shortcomings of their societies, nay, their race. On the contrary, because what exercised them was their burning desire to see Africa recover from the predations of slavery and the slave trade, they were never reluctant to borrow from the rest of humanity. As we saw with Hutton in his foray into political philosophy, unrestricted by the appeal of indigenous modes of governance, we can imagine blighting aghast by a lot of the perorations on offer in our life, in our time, regarding the superiority of, quote unquote, indigenous or traditional African education by those driven by the binaries that we repeatedly disavow in this discussion. We need be reminded that Blyden lived in an era where what is now derided as Western or Eurocentric education was in its infancy in most parts of the continent. So it was not hegemonic, it was not dominant. It was really a very small minority of people who were exposed to it. <clears throat> Indigenous systems of education were overwhelmingly dominant and Islamic education was widespread. If anyone was in a vantage position to make an informed comparative assessment of the different types of education, as well as their relative advantages and disadvantages in real time, it was blighting. <clears throat> Consistent with his belief that modernity for which Christianity was the vector in West Africa, in spite of the ravages of the slave trade and slavery that Africans had been prey to, and the racism that infected some of its educational institutions and materials held the best mode of social living that would move Africa to progress fastest. He was unabashed in his embrace of and praise for liberal education. I will let him make his case. At his inauguration as a professor at the Liberia College, the same place where Cromer taught, he wasted no time in taking this ground, and I quote, the fear need not be entertained that a course of study in this institution will fit men for the practical duties of life, render them proud and distant and haughty and overbearing. Such is not the effect of a true education. I am aware that there prevails with some, and perhaps not entirely without foundation, the opinion that the effect of superior education is to inflate men and render them impracticable. This is not, however, the legitimate effect of true knowledge. They are utter strangers to the genial influences of literature upon the social sentiments, who suppose that men must be distant and haughty and cold in proportion as they are profound. Every country has its peculiar circumstances and characteristics. So has Liberia. From this fact, it has often been argued that we need a peculiar kind of education, not so much colleges and high schools as other means which are more immediately and obviously connected with our progress. But to this we reply that if we are part of the human family, we have the same intellectual needs that other men have and they must be supplied by the same means. It shows a painful ignorance of history to consider the present state of things in Liberia as new and unprecedented in such a sense as to render dispensable those most important and fundamental means of improvement which other countries have enjoyed. Mind is everywhere the same, and everywhere it receives its character and formation from the same elemental principles. If it has been properly formed and has received a substantial character, it will work out its own calling 
solve its own problems, achieve its own destiny. Again, we see affirmed here that comparative perspective that made them not shrink from acknowledging the deplorable state of their societies. But that acknowledgement was a call to arms, an invitation for all hands to be on deck to end that state and birth a more salubrious one for their people. If, as it claimed, mind is everywhere the same, why would we be in the business of looking for some culture-based definition of the mind and then proclaim that only certain minds are suited for certain types of education? And there's a whole lot of that going on now in the decolonization discourse, which I think is tragic. <clears throat> and it goes on. It cannot be denied that the studies which have been pursued in this institution are of great utility to this country just now. The college course will include all those studies by which a people's mind and heart are formed. We shall have the study of language, a study which aids greatly in the training and discipline of the mind. We shall have the study of mathematics and physical science, which involves, of course, a study of the laws of nature and the acquirement of the essential preliminary knowledge of all calculations, measurements, and observations on the sea and on the land. We shall have, besides jurisprudence and international law, the study of intellectual and moral philosophy by which is gained a knowledge of the mind, the laws of thought, and of our duties to ourselves, to our fellow men, to society, and to God. But we need a quote-unquote practical education in Liberia, true, and so did the first settlers in North America. And does not the college course supply such an education? What is a practical education? It is not simply preparing a person specially for one sphere of life. It aims at practical results of a more important character, at imparting not simply skill in keeping accounts, in pleading at the bar, in surveying the land, in navigating a vessel, but skill in exercising the intellect accurately and readily upon any subject brought before us. The skill secured by college education is skill in the use of the mind. <clears throat> I have refrained from paraphrasing Blyden because for a thinker so identified with black nationalism, the original coiner of the phrase the African personality, the same one who eventually turned his back on what some call Western civilizations. This was my ring false or doctored. Additionally, by encasing liberal thinkers like Blyden in the concrete of identity defined by difference, we inadvertently deny ourselves and by extension the world of a mind whose expostulations remain as relevant today as when they were originally written deep in the 19th century in West Africa. And not just in today's West Africa, in the country where I live now, I made my home, the United States. I dare anybody to say that what Blyden wrote about liberal education that I just wrote has no relevance in the United States of America. <laughs> but you are not likely to find people looking to Africa to somebody like Blyden when they are looking for inspiration, for authorities, for scholars you know, of liberal education because such are not supposed to be found there. <clears throat> Finally, in hmm, an article titled The Aims and Methods of a Liberal Education, he wrote, the object of all education is to secure growth and efficiency, to make a man all that his natural gifts will allow him to become, to produce self-respect, a proper appreciation of our own powers and of the powers of other people, to beget a fitness for one's sphere of life and action and ability to discharge the duties it imposes. And it goes on to list you know, the various things that you know, they are going to be teaching. But this one I have to share with you before I go on to Cromwell. A great deal of misapprehension prevails in the popular mind as to the utility in a liberal education of the so-called dead languages. And many fancy that the time devoted to their study is time lost. Two years ago, Howard University shut down its classics department. A tragedy that some of us protested, but we did not succeed. 
But let it be understood that their study is not pursued merely for the information they impart. If information were all, it would be far more useful to learn the French and German or any of the other modern languages during the time devoted to Greek and Latin. But what is gained by the study of the ancient languages is that is that strengthening and disciplining of the mind which enables the student in life to lay hold of and with comparatively little difficulty to master any business to which he may turn his attention. Let us now conclude this discussion with the reflections of Alexander Cromwell. <clears throat> Can I do this in five minutes? <laughs> Let me try. Um, Cromwell subscribed to what has been called in the historiography of the period, providential determinism, under which many of them saw slavery as the wilderness that they had to go through to get to the light of modern, that is Christian civilization, that became theirs as an unintended consequence and which they were duty bound to take back to their hidden sisters and brothers left in Africa. Because Cromwell wrote this, my friend, classmate, and scholar of African-American history, actually wrote a book uh, titled On African-Americans, where he excoriated people like Cromwell in particular for being no different from Hegel, you know, and for having a racist view, you know, of Africa because they said that Africa was backward and it was the duty of African-Americans to go back to Africa to civilize the place. Uh, and, you know, in my rejoinder to him, uh, I said, no, no, they did not have a genetic explanation for African backwardness. In fact, they referenced slavery and the slave trade as a principal cause of the destruction in the African rhythm in history. And that difficulty was remediable. And he then wrote extensively for African Americans to go back to Africa to help rebuild the continent, you know, after the ravages of slavery, you know, uh, and the slave trade. And I would just, you know, conclude, you know, by um, <clears throat> so something that we're still dealing with talks about the resources of Africa. At that time, he said those resources were being exploited by non-Africans. And he then said, now all this flows into the coffers of white men. I mean nothing invidious by this. I state a fact, and I'm utterly unconscious of any unworthy or ungenerous feeling in stating it. Quote, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and this fullness he has given to man, irrespective of race or color. The main condition of the obtainment of it is intelligence, forecast, skill, and enterprise. If the black man, the black man I mean civilized and enlightened, has lined before him a golden heritage and fails to seize upon and to appropriate it, providence nonetheless intends it to be seized upon and wills it to be used. Uh, I've been asking people to check for me uh, in the private papers of Lord Lugard, the arch philosopher of British imperialism, who wrote a book called The Dual Mandate in Tropical Africa, where he made essentially the argument that, you know, civilized people could not leave those resources, you know, untapped, and that that was part of why they were there. Uh, was it pilfering material from Cromwell? Who knows? You know, this stuff was published, it was available, but I mention it because whereas Luga just wanted to rape Africa, Cromwell wanted to use those resources to build Africa and using the gains that have been made by people like him uh, who had had, you know, uh, to so let me now uh, conclude. <clears throat> what I have done in this lecture is to seed the bed of our discourse with materials that are easily available, but for reasons some of which I've offered remain unapprehended by scholars at the time, at the present time. Whether it is the preference for the political discourse of modernity or the supremacy of liberal education of the necessity of borrowing for civilizational growth. Uh, the borrowing actually comes from Cromwell saying that no society, quoting Reynold Niebuhr, that no society has ever developed 
through its own internal resources that all societies get developed from outside. Again, philosophically, we can argue about that, but it's a very important point, you know, that we need to pay, you know, attention to. What is clear is that the insights to be garnered from our engagements with Horton, Blyden, and Cromwell promise reward, whether we are reading them in Lagos, in Bangkok, in Seoul, or in Buenos Aires. The problems of which they treat are not, quote-unquote, African, but eminently, quote-unquote, human problems. I thank you for your patience. <clears throat>